Yeah, this is our April meeting. We're talking about getting to zero with FIAS and net zero energy. Um, and this is part of our overall uh, campaign on passive house plus renewables equals net zero energy, um, which is the proven equation for our net zero future. So this fits into that series. We're going to continue this series in the months to come. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to our own Hank Keating here in a moment to sort of talk a little bit about this. Uh, but I do want to give an overall welcome to our future speakers tonight, Kat McClingenberg and Lisa White from FIAS. Um, very great to have you both here. Um, thanks for joining us. Hello. So with that, <laughs> with that said, um, I'm just going to turn things right over to Hank uh, to get started with uh, a little bit about what tonight is, is all about and what this campaign on Passive House Plus Renewables Equals Net Zero Energy is, is for. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Um, yes, so we have really decided that we need to have this kind of a push uh, to say that passive house plus renewables equals net zero, that it's the proven equation for our net zero future. There's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm in all over the state of Massachusetts in all kinds of localities to push for net zero zoning, net zero building codes, net zero uh, zoning benefits. Um, and yet there's not really tremendous understanding at every level of what net zero is and how, how you get to it. So we, we're starting a campaign, which I'll describe in some more detail, to have a series of presentations to try to help define this issue and particularly to define the role of, that we see for Passive House in that. So uh, what better place to start than with a presentation from, from Kat and Lisa later regarding FIAS and net zero energy, which I know they've been working hard on. Next slide. So we're launching a campaign um, and this is gonna be involving the codes and also uh, maintaining and expanding passive out re rebates. Uh, I'll talk about the meetings that are coming up as we go through. Um, but let's look at the next slide, Aaron. The next slide, this is what shows the, the progress that we've made with rebates so far in this state. The Mass Save program, which is offering just over $3,000 a unit for multifamily passive house certified, has now enrolled over 7,100 units since we started it. And that was not even three years ago. The pro this three-year cycle is not complete, and the, this number is not even up to date. So we could easily, when this first three-year plan hit 10,000 units, and we are maintaining our lobbying to get this program continued, which I am essentially 100% sure this will be continued for the following three years, and we would hope that it would pick up steam. So we could be looking at 20, 30,000 units of passive house multifamily. At the same time, we're pushing for, and I think we will get a passive house incentive program that is for one to four units. Um, this is just a curious break off. This program covers five plus units, um, but their programs go that way, one to four, five plus. So I think in this next three year plan, we will add to that a one to four program. So we have a lot of passive house work that's coming down the pike and we need now to really marry it to uh, net zero. So let's go to the next slide. So uh, our net zero future is gonna be defined by new regulations and laws and this is good. It's not simply advocates pushing for it. They've, there's been enough advocacy done in this state to get to the point where we have a draft uh, 2030 clean energy climate plan that calls for net zero by 2050 and 45% reduction uh, below 1990 by 2030. I point out the language that's highlighted below that it was requiring that DOER put together a high performance stretch code 
energy code requiring passive house level building envelope efficiency that's available for communities by 2022. Let's look at the next slide now. So this is what's actually happened. Since that draft, the, the Mass Climate Roadmap, an act creating next generation mode wrap for Massachusetts climate policy was signed into law on 326, so a few weeks ago. And that actually ups the ante. It goes beyond the CEPC. It says it has to be 50% reduction of carbon emissions by 2030. And it also specifies that the DOER must develop and promulgate new municipal opt-in stretch code that includes net zero building standards and a definition of net zero building within that. That's again, going beyond what was in the CECP. Um, so it's pushing the governor in particular beyond where he really wanted to be. Um, I will point out that even here, there's a little bit of a hedge in that you'll say it says, net zero building standards, but it doesn't say that this code has to require them. And I think the lobbying battle is here is gonna be, will that be required or will it be an optional track for people to elect to take? And there's gonna be a lot of back and forth on that over the next 12 months as they try to put this together. Um, and I just underscore the, the last item there, $12 million per year to mass CEC for workforce training. I mean, that is huge. This is, this is taking what we're doing in paying 50% uh, of the tuition for uh, doing certification training and spreading it out to across the building trades and sub trades and into um, you know, justice communities, equal justice communities to get the workforce training done. And if we are to build all of these passive units and meet the other goals of the CECP, which include massive amounts of retrofits and electrification and heat pump installation across existing buildings, we don't have anything like the workforce we need to get that work done. So this $12 million per year to Mass CEC to develop these training programs is massive commitment to, to advance this agenda. Next slide, please. Um, and this is a, just an example at the other end. Both of those are statewide action plans. This is the Boston Climate Action Plan. So I put this up just to note that these type of regulations are coming up at every level of government across the state. So here we have the Boston Climate Action Plan that's pushing for zero net carbon standards. Uh, and they're starting out with affordable housing, but they're pushing it very quickly into their um, zoning requirements to, to make it work with a market rate. They have leverage with affordable because they tend to put money into affordable deals. So that's where they can step in and make these requirements, but they'll be using other mechanisms to get at all the rest of the buildings. Uh, I'll take the next slide. And this is yet another uh, example of how fine a grain these type of regulations and laws are getting. So they have produced, Boston has produced a guidebook for zero emission buildings. And that's a guidebook that they are handing out to people and saying, if you just build like this, you will meet the goals. And I think this is a double-edged sword and it really um, is part of our conversation as to why Passive House as a standard is so important. Because I think that there's a lot of arguments to be made that simplifying some of these type of requirements, uh, as for example, in this guidebook, they would recommend R36 
for every building type, every size, ranging from a, a high rise building to a two unit building. I don't think that's necessarily a wise recommendation. Um, and we are, uh, we pushed very hard and they've, they've come around to say that for larger projects, which they define as 40 units plus, passive house could be used in an alternative standard to their prescriptive wall sections. Um, but at the moment, they still are saying that for, sm for smaller buildings up to 40 units, they want you to use their prescriptive walls. And this is where, again, I think that passive house as a certification standard gets to be so important to, to guarantee durability for these buildings. Next slide. So what is a net zero building? We can hit the next. Is it this? Well, some buildings may end up having to do this if they're huge enough and they don't have enough, <laughs> they don't have enough land, but that's not the perception we want. So if we go to the next slide. It's interesting, what is a net zero building is in fact something that the DOER is charged with under the new climate bill law to define, what is it? And the more we ask that question, the harder it gets to answer exactly what that definition will be. But graphically, we think that the bullet center is the perfect example of how you illustrate what it means to be net zero in terms of the relationship between solar and base building. Let's look at the next slide, which really does it by pointing out how big would that have to be if it weren't meeting the basic energy uh, reduction standards that it's met. Um, and that's why we think that passable performance has to be the basis of performance and we can go to the next slide. And passive house has to be the quality control necessary to make sure that what we build is good. Passive house is based on fundamental building science, certified training programs, qualified assurance reviews, field verifications, and monitoring. And our view is that passive house certification is the discipline our design and construction industry currently needs to rapidly scale up the production of net zero buildings. And what follows that statement is to, is to do it safely, is to do it with buildings that are durable, is to do it with buildings that perform as we expect them to be performing. And that's why we brought Kat and Lisa here tonight to talk about specifically what FIAS can do to help us maintain that agenda and do it with healthy, durable buildings. So I'm gonna turn it over to them now. All right, am I, am I showing? Yes, you are. Mm -hmm. All right, <laughs> cool. Take it away, right, excellent. Um, Lisa, you, you will have to advance for me, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, well, um, welcome, thanks for having us. Um, really excited to be back. Um, uh, we have been with your community for quite many years. And um, I think with all that is happening right now, it's really um, a great moment in time to reflect a little bit of uh, where we all have been and where we're going from here. Uh, with um, things developing much, 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 much faster, I think, even uh, than we had expected. So um, the title, thank you for suggesting that, Aaron and Hank, um, because that also uh, is a really good thing for us to talk about, uh, getting to zero fears and net zero. We've been uh, plugging along on that path for a very long time. Uh, in the very early days when fears were still in its baby shoes, I remember like on our initial website, we had uh, carbon neutrality uh, is within reach now. Um, and then we started to plug away with uh, the basics, with the envelope basics, always with um, the goal in mind that we would eventually get to zero. 
and that uh, passive building really is the the best path to to get to zero. Um, just a quick note uh, mentioning here this uh, project that uh, you can see. Uh, this is the first office building slash uh, so zero building that uh, FIAS certified. This is the Rocky Mountain Institute, just as an example. And that is already quite a few years old now. Uh, and uh, they they showed how, how it can be done even in a very harsh climate zone. Like I think this one is six or seven. Um, next slide, Lisa, please. So just the agenda real quick, uh, I'll try to keep my introduction short and brief. Uh, as I just mentioned, reflection on like, where have we uh, been and where are we going? And at our core competencies, developing standards uh, and uh, certification to, as Hank mentioned, assure the quality assurance of the design process, the implementation of the process, and then also the, the monitoring and verification in the end that the buildings perform. And then Lisa will hop in and uh, talk about the, the meat of the new standard uh, of 2021 and the changes that have been made by the tech committee in that kind of like progression of developing the certification certification standards. Um, next slide. So uh, just really quickly in this review process, um, the FIAS mission has uh, obviously also evolved over the years. As I said, like initially we could only dream of carbon neutrality to, to even get there. We, we formulated it very carefully, like carbon neutrality within reach. But uh, that said, our mission has always been to address the climate crisis, uh, to come up with standards programs, best building practices that guide the building uh, community towards net zero buildings. And that's what we have been uh, always uh, focusing on. And our vision, when we first crafted it in 2009, uh, you might smile a little bit with me, uh, was a little bit more ambitious. We uh, said that we wanted to make passive building and net zero was not in there yet. Uh, we, we were not that crazy, but we said uh, we wanted to make passive building uh, code by 2020. So the good news here is uh, it was in the end, maybe not that far out there because in 2020, in fact, uh, passive building standards have uh, gotten written into many state codes by now. And there's even an ASHRAE standard now on the way uh, that is trying to formulate best practices for a passive building standard. So we really have come a long way. Next slide. So um, what do we do exactly? Um, we, um, our core competencies here are, as I mentioned, the certification programs for buildings, uh, all with an uh, eye towards quality assurance uh, to make sure that that goes off without a hitch. Um, we need the professionals to be trained in the tools and the standards and the best uh, practices. And you're all familiar, uh, if you've been within the community for a while, if you're new, um, there are three really key players in our opinion. There's the designer slash architect uh, consultant, uh, there's the builder uh, and uh, tradesperson, of course, also on the next level. And then uh, the FIAS uh, certified radar and verifier, very important. We learned our lesson very early on that without really uh, stringent quality assurance uh, along the way, buildings just didn't perform. So those are really, really crucial uh, elements as Hank already mentioned. And then in addition to that, we're also ramping up our certification programs for, um, for uh, products and um, components that are being used in passive buildings and verified. Next uh, slide, please. So just quickly, the milestones of the standard development. And that that is really, um, pretty remarkable how far we've come. And I think it's worth to look at that uh, evolution uh, in a little bit more detail. And of course it didn't start in 2012 uh, and it has been a process. So as you can see as in the subtitle, challenged, adapted, revamped and expanded. And as we have been kind of like talking internally like where FIAS is headed now with all the things that have happened that we have accomplished, that we the, the issues that we discovered and solved and where we're headed now, like um, charter, chartering new territory with the whole uh, zero energy uh, expansion, uh, which uh, also makes us leave a little bit like, uh, not just a little bit like, uh, makes us get out of our comfort zone of the building, which I feel we have done really well and have kind of like uh, uh, solved the, the design guidance for that envelope. We, we find in our buildings that the envelope performs 
slam dunk. Uh, what is now off uh, improving zero energy performance uh, seems to be uh, a part of the mechanical systems design. And that's why uh, you might have seen some of the announcements. Next week, we have uh, uh, the mechanical summit coming up because that really needs uh, some serious attention. So back to the envelope and passive building baseline standards that we've been working on. So. Uh, our deep roots are in the 70s, uh, oil embargo, the original passive designs that uh, came out of that period. Uh, then in 2012, we incorporate uh, all the good best building practices that the uh, DOE had already uh, put together and uh, we uh, incorporated zero energy ready home. At that point, making a statement, yes, we are essentially saying like passive building is the baseline for zero and we're, we're calling that uh, zero energy ready. Uh, with that came also um, uh, Energy Star, Noir Plus and, and uh, Water Sense later as well. And at that point already, like uh, that probably went unnoticed, we soft launched Fierce Plus projects that uh, achieved so zero. They, we created an add-on badge, not the full blown certification yet because we felt it was kind of like too far out there. In 2015 then, with the climate specific and cost optimized standards, we, we solved uh, further uh, challenges that we had encountered as we were uh, applying the best building practices, building science in various climates. And we learned a whole bunch of lessons, uh, not only uh, that the building has to uh, react to climate specific uh, conditions, but also that the typology made uh, a difference, right? And that typology adaptation that then uh, we incorporated in the 2018 update and in the 2018 update we actually felt our way forward towards a potential zero energy certification with like on the path to zero we tried to mimic the 2030 kind of like schedule to get to zero by 2030. Uh, and then now the exciting part in 2021 everything has moved a lot faster than we had really hoped. The tech committee actually um, uh, and this is in my opinion, the most significant development of 2021, they did away with the on the path to zero. They said like, nope, we're just going to do like legacy, like past building on site uh, standards only, or you go to zero and you go all the way. No more of this like kind of like incremental tightening of targets on the path to zero. And that means we're already here. Uh, it's actually cost effective. Next slide. So very quickly, you, you all are familiar with the uh, building science principles um, that uh, we've been using as part of our design strategy. They are all uh, reflected in the modeling tools that we all use to optimize our buildings to meet passive building standards. So there's no, uh, no surprise here other than uh, that those different building pr science principles, they have bigger punch uh, in different climates. Um, and uh, the next slide, kind of like, um, that used to be a big revelation to me when we finally were like, wow, yeah, of course, like there are all these different climate zones. And it's not just that it's like very cold, cold, uh, warm and hot. Um, on the, the legend on the left left hand side, and again, that ties back into the mechanical systems design, um, there's some complexity in those different um, climate zones. There's like high heating degree days, low cooling degree days. Uh, then at some point, humidity comes into, uh, into play. So you have those like very delicate kind of like um, kind of um, design balance considerations that, that you have to work with um, as you implement those different building science principles. And um, as we felt our way along, we, we decided like cost had to be dealt with. And while we were doing this, we were dealing with climate specific design. We came, came up with that. We solved like uh, an adapt, uh, we solved to uh, optimize for building typology in the next iteration, 2018. And while we were at it, we also cost optimized, which actually then in the market led to a passive building takeoff. So all of a sudden, something remarkable happened. Like somehow there is an alignment of the tools of the cost uh, proposition and um, uh, buildings have become affordable. Um, they, they, we can, we can do this now for one. And secondly, uh, as Hank uh, so very well pointed out um, with Massachusetts ahead of everybody else, there's political will and uh, political leadership 
uh, in order to meet the climate crisis challenge, they have taken two passive building standards and um, are starting to support it uh, widely. So this is really uh, pretty remarkable. Next slide. So, and again, also the proof is in the pudding, as we always have said. Um, we continue to try to improve our tools, our algorithms, but as we have developed those standards along the way, we always went back to our tools and our algorithms and verified them and really kind of tried to find the ones that were still weak. And we still have a few that are really weak and that need some serious solving. But uh, we have, again, come a long way uh, compared to any other uh, modeling success, modeling versus performance. We, we're doing incredibly well. We're within like 7% plus or minus. And again, there are some outliers, like uh, we have already identified the reasons for that when mechanical systems are not properly um, commissioned or the systems are not designed correctly. So, so we're really zeroing in on the mechanical systems as kind of like being the culprit here. Next slide. Um, we can hop over this real quick, but um, this is important um, for, uh, for our development. We uh, aligned initially with the Zero Energy Ready Home, then uh, they took to us incorporated us into their uh, high performance kind of like staircase all the way to zero with fierce plus so zero being like the, the highest certification uh, getting to zero. Um, next slide. So and then in 2018 we um, uh, well I mentioned this already um, we, we essentially thought that things were moving much slower than uh, they actually ended up moving. And we came up with this kind of like tiered approach, like uh, with FIES plus 18 landing in between of the original passive building standard and the net zero or source zero home um, that is either zeroing out or uh, overproducing. So in 2021, we've done away with that, as I mentioned. So and Lisa will talk about this in more detail. So last couple of slides, just quickly um, giving you a little bit of a, a, a couple of stats on like where we are with our projects right now. Um, really looking great. Um, the uptake has been phenomenal. Uh, codes, state codes, uh, Washington DC, uh, Mass, New York, uh, Washington state, um, they have all in some form or another um, incorporated passive building standards and have um, uh, some form of incentive available. So look at these numbers here. So uh, right now we are, we're at 820 projects in North America and you can see it's really pretty much starting to kind of spread out over all different climate zones. Uh, 9,500 units um, and a hell lot of square footage over here. So I know we had like 10, uh, <laughs> Uh, that we're starting to really get up there and we're starting to see the exponential growth curve uh, develop, except with one little bump. Next slide, uh, which was to be expected uh, our pandemic year 2020. So in 2020, uh, quite a few projects stalled. Uh, no surprise there. Actually, I, I think maybe all of you had like a little bit of a funny feeling uh, how that all would shake out, but turned out that we at least held steady, more or less, plus or minus. And uh, the projections for 2021 are looking already kind of like uh, we're continuing that uh, exponential growth curve. So uh, this slide right here shows pre-certified uh, certified, pre -certified square footage. The previous numbers were submitted um, certified and pre-certified. So great, great momentum uh, that we have going here. Uh, I think I have one more slide two more slides uh, that speak to our source zero certification. Uh, and that kind of sets the stage for Lisa to take off from here in terms of like getting to zero. Um, this is our fastest growing certification program. Uh, that's very exciting. So uh, with 82 total projects uh, in the database now, certified, pre-certified and submitted as you can see right here. And they also are starting to show up uh, all over the map. Uh, next, uh, last slide. And um, obviously we're hoping to grow this and to shift now all the way over to zero with passive building and passive building standards as the understood baseline conservation first. Lisa, please take over. Thanks. It looks like my dog wants to join too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really. um, thanks Kat, thanks for setting the stage there. Um, Video is over. Okay, 
So I'm going to be mostly talking about the changes that came along with PS 2021, as well as kind of the core or main certification requirements and the kind of derivatives of those with the focus on 2021 and how we really took a step towards zero. Um, so kind of our theme here is emissions down and scale up. And we kind of attack these in two different ways. Um, so emissions down, uh, Kat kind of alluded to it, but we, we took that step towards zero. And zero we're hoping is our main certification. And I'll go into a lot more detail with that. We took out this middle glide path. There's no more in between ground. It's like you either do the conservation, the, like Kat said, the, the kind of standard passive building best practice, or you go to zero and there's no in between certification. Um, and then scale up, I'll talk at the very end a little bit about our prescriptive program, which we're hoping will provide a little more accessibility to the passive building um, standards and just reach a, a greater part of the market. Okay, so Kat showed this last graphic with 2018, again, the four, the four levels. Um, now we're on to the 2021, hide my video there. Okay, um, where we essentially again, scrapped that middle level and so now we have the a baseline and then you reduce that with conservation measures to get to core. And then that's all on site, on the building site. And then you can go to zero by utilizing core and then renewables, whether that's on site or off site is up to the project teams. So I think Hank already hammered this one into the ground, but really our, our motto here is first passive then zero. Um, the, your first investments, if you're going to go to zero must be in conservation, you can't skip the passive measures or the active conservation measures, you need to have the good envelope, the air tightness, all the building science principles Kat showed on that slide. That's what I'm talking about with conservation here. Um, and then you go to renewable energy. Um, and I'll maybe hit on this a little bit later in the presentation at the very end, but essentially the conservation makes even more financial sense when you think about this at a systems level. So when you think about beyond the building, when you think about the fact that we're transitioning our entire grid to renewable energy, hopefully, um, and that's an intermittent variable resource, we're also increasing load on the grid with electrifying buildings, electri electrifying vehicles. And this is gonna be a big costly transition and buildings can help with this transition or help facilitate that by using conservation efforts up front and by using passive building strategies. Okay. So for, I'm going to set the framework of getting to zero with the passive building baseline and how we look at this and then go into kind of the, how this framework uh, fits within our certification framework. Okay, so you got to start with good best building, building science principles, best practices, quality, health, durability, all of those good things about a building. And then we turn to passive conservation strategies. So again, those are the, the air tightness, the, the good envelope, the balanced ventilation with heat cover, recovery. Um, optimizing windows and solar gains. We all understand the passive conservation strategies. And then we go to active conservation strategies. Again, that's equipment efficiencies, appliance efficiencies, plug load, minimization, if, depending on your building typology. And this is where, <clears throat> and this is how you get to core. This is where we set the, the target for core. And again, this is kind of on the building boundary. This is your <clears throat> on-site target for us, for net source energy. And then, if you're going to go to zero, then you turn to on-site renewable energy when possible. And then anything you can't do on-site, you turn to off-site renewable energy. Um, so this is really the hierarchy and that gets you to zero. You don't have to have both. You can have a combination of the two, you can have one or the other, um, but essentially you need to make sure you're getting those, those active and passive conservation strategies to a certain point before turning to zero. And our certification framework is aligned really well with these different strategies. Um, so the quality, health, and durability is ensured with the air tightness requirements, the moisture control requirements, as well as the third-party prerequisite programs that Kat was showing on that kind of DOE um, high-performance staircase, those um, third-party recognized programs that really take care of that, that bottom level. Then we specifically set targets on space conditioning, demands, and loads. And this tells you how far to go with the passive conservation strategies. So again, we're, we're kind of setting different buckets or different boundaries around these different things to guide designers and building teams on how far to go with each of these. So the space conditioning, demand and load targets tell you how far to go with passive strategies. Then we have the core net zero, or sorry, the core net source energy target, which tells you how far, okay, I did all my passive conservation strategies. Now, how good does my equipment have to be? My, my heating, cooling equipment, my hot water equipment, my appliances. 
the coordinate source energy target tells you that. So how far do you push with active conservation strategies? And then the zero net source energy target tells you how much renewables you need to have. So this is kind of how we built the certification or really built the framework around the hierarchy of getting to a, a zero energy building using passive building as a baseline. So I'm gonna go through the main certification requirements again in the context of FIAS 2021 with a little bit of information about the development just for anyone that isn't familiar, but I'll try to, I'll try to breeze through that since I assume most of you are familiar with previous standards. Um, so the main certification requirements, uh, we have the space conditioning targets, like I just mentioned. We have air tightness, which I did separate out here. Um, although it is really, it's a passive building, it's a passive conservation strategy and it's a quality assurance strategy for building durability. So it kind of fits in the other buckets on the other page, but it's really important to passive building. So it, it is separate here. Um, we have the on-site quality assurance and testing and inspection from the third party. And then we have a net source energy target. So the top three items here remain the same for all levels of certification. And then the net source energy target varies. So I'm gonna talk through each of these um, briefly. So the space conditioning targets, um, Kat already set, set the stage for this already. We talked, um, she talked about how they are cost optimized. So essentially what that means is we're optimizing for how we can save the most energy for the least amount of cost. And the cost is a combination of upfront costs and investment to conserve like getting more insulation, better windows, more heat, uh, higher heat recovery efficiency on your equipment. So cost of upfront investment financed over time and the operational cost to operate the building. So that, that's your cost. We're optimizing to lower that relative to energy savings. Um, so we did this for lots of different um, building sizes, occupant densities. You can kind of see some of the, the samples in the bottom. But what it looked like is essentially lots of different upgrade packages and we pick the lowest point. So we're able to save the most energy for the least amount of total cost. And that's where we found that sweet spot in investment for conservation. Um, there's a couple things to note about the optimization is we did um, constrain the windows based on comfort um, and we did set the air tightness target to the FIAS level because uh, we believe that's really important for building durability even if it's not important for energy in some climates. And then we ignored the cost of PV for, because PV cannot, um, it can't compete with conservation. These are two different buckets as I tried to point out in the beginning. It's, it's not, oh, do I add more insulation or do I add another PV panel? They're not, they can't compete in the same arena. So conservation on its own through passive measures has its own financial and economic feasibility that is separate from the renewable energy. And that's really the message we're trying to get across is you can't ignore the conservation part. There we go. Okay, so we have targets set for annual demands and peak loads. Uh, essentially, this is just how much heating or cooling energy must you deliver to the space over the course of the year or at the peak hour. Um, lower peak loads require lower or smaller mechanical systems. So there is a direct cost with lowering peak loads. Um, and again, these are met with passive measures. You can't lower your annual demand by getting a, a better heat pump or something. These are all met with passive measures. So these are guiding you on how far to go with the passive conserva conservation principles. And then we have these targets for a thousand tons of a thousand plus climates in North America. And we have the specific uh, calculator on our website where you set, you um, calculate these targets. So they vary based on the climate, uh, building size, dwelling unit density and occupant density. Uh, the dwelling unit density is a residential only thing. Uh, and that was actually added into 2021. So those familiar with FIAS 2018, this looks pretty similar to the 2018 calculator, but there was a little bit of refinement with the target setting. I guess I should mention here, I don't have a slide on it, that we did expand the, um, the scope of the optimization to include tiny homes. Um, so we got down to, I think, a 200 square foot, 200-ish square foot building. So like basically the range studied is better so that we have better targets for smaller buildings. Um, we did not expand on the upper end. And um, we added the factor for dwelling units just to kind of get a better fit for, um, we found that dwelling units and occupants played a big role in the internal heat gain. It wasn't just one or the other. And previously we were just looking at occupant density. Um, so you use this calculator and it will tell you the specific space conditioning criteria. And again, those guide you on how far to go with passive measures. Okay, getting into air tightness. 
Um, this target is set strictly based on building durability. There's a study done by our technical committee back in 2015 um, that essentially was an allowable amount of air leakage or air, um, yeah, air leakage to the building enclosure that was okay from a moisture and durability perspective. Um, so of course there's energy savings with air tightness in almost all climates, but it's really set based on building durability. So the requirement is per square foot of envelope area, um, 0.06 CFM 50 per square foot if you're measuring at 50 pascals and 0.08 if you're measuring at 75. And then there's a slightly higher allowance for larger buildings. But this is something that has to be tested and it's a pass fail. Um, and you need to test pressurization and depressurization and take the average and that must meet this requirement. So this is a, this is a hard requirement for the, for the certification. Okay, so air tightness again is part of the on-site quality assurance, but it's very specific to FIAS that I, I keep it separate and it's a, um, a big passive building principle that's, that's super important to keep in mind. Okay, so the on-site quality assurance, um, Kat talked about this a little bit, but again, we, we built these on the recognized systems, the Zero Energy Ready Home, Energy Star, EPA and R plus and ResNet. So we're building all of these quality and health and some moisture related requirements into the program by just leaning on the programs that already exist and people are familiar with and that are great programs in, in our country. Um, so um, these are essentially things that don't show up in the energy model, like passive house people think energy, right? And it is, and, and that's really what we brought to the table is we brought um, methodologies to reduce energy use in buildings, but there's a lot of things that don't show up in kilowatt hours that are super important to the building. Um, so the quality assurance is really critical to um, assure what was actually designed is what was built. Uh, so it's a third party process. There's a lot of site visits. Uh, the blower door testing happens then. the ventilation systems balanced. You inspect the insulation, do infrared imaging to make sure um, even the cavities that you can't see are insulated properly. Um, so this is really insurance for the building to make sure, okay, what I actually put on paper is what is in the field. And um, super, super important part, uh, Kat showed that, that graph of what was actually, how the buildings were actually performing relative to how they were designed in the energy model. Super important to hitting that number, uh, making sure the systems are actually performing as you intended, super important. Other requirements, again, these are kind of things that don't show up in energy, but are super important to us and to a quality building. So we have a requirement for U values based on uh, comfort. So essentially the taller your window, the tighter the U value gets. And we have a limit, we basically we assure there's no condensation on windows, a limited risk. There can always be the potential of condensation on windows, but if you're meeting the comfort requirement, generally this is never an issue. Uh, we look at moisture control and assemblies. So we look at vapor profiles of assemblies to make sure there's not issues related to mold or rot within the assembly. And then we also look at moisture control at unavoidable thermal bridging. So in a retrofit scenario, um, we have a, a protocol where we can assess different thermal bridges to make sure there's not gonna be an issue of mold growth or condensation at that uh, junction either. Okay, so then into the net source energy, and this is where we get to kind of the zero conversation. Um, so those that aren't familiar, which I assume most of you are again, but source energy is essentially just site energy, or whatever your utility bill is, multiplied by a source energy factor based on the fuel type that you use. Um, FIAS uses a national scale for that. So we use the United States for projects in the US, we have a factor for Canada, um, so, or for, for grid electricity and then natural gas uh, for both US and Canada are the same. So natural gas is at 1.1. Uh, US grid electricity is at 1.8 now with FIAS 2021. And Canada remains at 1.96. So the US number reflects a 2050 outlook. So we are forward looking in that grid electricity number. And this was kind of one step we took toward incentivizing electrification in buildings, kind of putting grid electricity on more of a level playing field with natural gas, considering that most of the buildings we build today, or this is maybe halfway through their life, um, maybe earlier than halfway through their life at 2050. So if we kept using today's grid electricity number, it kind of still, it can give natural gas a bit of a uneven or unfair 
uh, advantage in the calculations to meet that source energy target. So we use the 2050 number for the US and we're still working on kind of a future projected number for Canada and intend to update that as well. Um, okay, so I've kind of beat this one to the ground, but um, again, core is the conservation, apply all the passive building principles. Once you do that, add the renewables, then go to zero. So that, that's really our goal here and that's our message. Um, if you're familiar with the zero code, they tell you design an energy efficient building and then address the remaining needs with on-site or off-site renewable energy. And we're pretty much on the same page there, except for their reference to an energy efficient building is the most up-to-date IECC or ASHRAE code. And we say, nope, go to core and then go to zero. So it's same principles, but we say go all the way to FIAS core, push further with conservation and then go to renewable energy. So the target for source energy, uh, same calculators you saw before, it varies based on the building typology. So whether it's residential or non-residential and um, for residential, it's also based on uh, the dwelling unit density and occupant density, and then the certification level. So the only thing that's actually changing here is the core target, the zero target stays zero. So here's kind of a summary of that. Residential, again, per person, the core target varies and it shows up in that calculator. It's supposed to vary to really be a true target for on-site conservation. So this is different from 2018 where the core target was a static number. Um, so now it, it does scale and it should be reasonable based on the relationship between the number of units and the number of occupants. Uh, for non-residential, the Again, zero target is zero and the core target is the same as it was for 2018, except it's scaled down to reflect the new source energy factor for grid electricity. So it's essentially, it's the same site energy number multiplied by the new source energy number. So renewable energy is obviously allowed to meet the zero program, but also a small amount is allowed for core. So if we look at um, 2018, FIAS 2018, uh, which was that middle path charting to zero, right? We treated on-site renewable energy and off-site pretty much the same. Uh, we did derate renewable energy certificates, but otherwise everything was kind of treated equally. Um, with FIAS zero, we are incentivizing on-site renewable energy and derating other options for off-site renewable energy, this bottom row here. Um, by 25%. So essentially we're favoring on-site renewable energy. And then for the off-site options, you have to get more than one kilowatt hour to offset one kilowatt hour at your building because of the losses associated with that, um, or the inefficiencies with it not being at your building site. For FIAS core to jump back, sorry to jump around here. Remember this is the building boundary. So anything off-site does not count. And the only thing that counts on site to meet your FIAS core target is coincident production and use of photovoltaics. And that really limits the amount you can add PV to a building to, um, to offset that source energy use. It's a small number. If you were to get all the way to net zero by definition, um, you would only get to account for like a third of that PV. So it's, it's not a lot. And it's really only what you can use and anything that's exported back to the grid does not count. So we have kind of factors for that based on climate zone. Uh, so this mostly aligns with ASHRAE 189.1 and mostly with Architecture 2030. Um, so we're trying to intentionally align with other programs to keep things uh, consistent for, for designers and jurisdictions out there as well. Okay, check on the time real quick. Okay, um, so we, like I mentioned in the beginning, have a new alternate approach for FIAS core. And that is the core prescriptive program. So I'm just going to very briefly talk about this. Okay, so this is kind of the certification path decision tree. Um, so I've mostly talked about everything on the left so far. And on the right, we're adding now a prescriptive path for core. Um, it's intended to achieve similar levels of efficiency as the performance path that I was talking about except it's all prescriptive and there's a much more limited scope. So if we look at this decision tree, essentially if it's single family duplex or townhome, then yes, you qualify for prescriptive. 
Um, so yeah, it's an attached and detached single family housing. And then if you are not doing Wolfie passive modeling, you can take the prescriptive route. Um, if you are doing Wolfie passive modeling or if it's not single family duplex or townhome, you don't have a, a choice. You must take the performance route, the standard route, which is either FIAS Core, uh, Core Revive, which is our retrofit certification program. And then if you choose to go to net zero from there, that's when you get to FIAS Zero or FIAS Zero Revive. Um, so we have, uh, sorry, uh, we have the, um, this little icon here that also shows that there is no combustion allowed with the core prescriptive and there's no combustion allowed with the zero program either, which I'll show. But essentially we still have um, the conservation level for performance and prescriptive and then only the performance program can go to zero. We do not have a prescriptive level for zero. So just at a very high level, so you guys understand the limitations to who can go prescriptive. Uh, again, single family detached or attached. We have a constraint on the amount of floor area per bedroom. So people aren't out there building McMansions to the prescriptive path, that's not our intent. No fossil fuel combustion on site no jetted tubs or indoor pools, and no natural draft fireplaces. So this is a very high level. Do I know if I can qualify under prescriptive? And then these are the general kind of buckets that we have requirements under. Um, so the scope limitations I just showed you. And then we have the next six, which are pretty much passive building uh, categories. So we have the air tightness. We have uh, requirements for compactness, building compactness. We have requirements for solar protection for the thermal enclosure, for moisture risk limitation. This is both in the opaque and uh, transparent enclosure. Then we have mechanical ventilation requirements. And then the orange buckets that we get into are the active conservation measures. So mechanical system efficiencies and then lighting appliances and hot water. And the way these orange buckets work is there is a trade-off. Um, essentially, it, there's kind of a quick method to meeting all of these if you can meet certain efficiencies or you can trade off between lighting appliances and hot water. Let's say you can't get a fridge that's under the certain limit. You can trade that off by getting, having a better lighting design or getting a better dishwasher or something like that. As long as the total that you're using is less than the proposed building. So there, there are a few trade offs. Um, and so this program is made up of kind of three types of requirements. One is universal requirements, things like no data tubs, universal requirement applies to all buildings. And then there are building specific requirements for things like compactness um, based on your building itself. What is the compactness ratio that you need? And then there are climate specific requirements, which is pretty much the most common one. Um, for things like solar protection, you need overhangs in certain climates. For thermal enclosure, you need certain R values in different climates. Um, moisture risk limitation, different vapor profiles required for different climates, mechanical ventilation, different heat recovery efficiencies required in different climates or, or humidity recovery efficiencies. Um, so a lot of it is climate specific. And so we've developed this tool um, called the snapshot and it really is just a snapshot. And what it does is it calculates most of those project specific requirements in a snapshot online calculator for you. So you can just get a really early sense, um, early in design sense of where you'd need to go with certain uh, certain elements. Uh, so this is just on our website and you go in and just like our performance calculator, you select your, your location, the size of your building, the number of bedrooms, number of stories, and it tells you the maximum envelope to floor area that you can have. It tells you your maximum whole window solar heat gain projection factor. Notice that these sections one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, these are the same as, as our buckets here. So it aligns with the, um, the general requirements that are in the checklist. So overhangs, what do you need? What's the maximum U value you can use for your windows? What are the minimum R values you can use for the different components? Um, condensation resistance factor, it's an FRSI for, for windows. Uh, mechanical ventilation efficiencies, and then efficiencies for um, different systems, depending on the type you pick. It's pretty limited on the type you pick because there's no combustion on site. So we've got different types of heat pumps, essentially. Uh, so this snapshot tool is really intended so you can get a really quick glimpse of 
of the project requirement, the project specific requirements. And then I'll track back. And then here's a screenshot of the much more comprehensive checklist, which is built in Excel. This is essentially the tool that you would use to submit the project and work through your design. So it outlines all the individual requirements. It also calculates those, those requirements that show up in the snapshot. Um, and it has some kind of guided calculators in there that help you see if you're meeting some of the individual requirements like the FRSI or the compactness ratio and things like that. Okay, so a couple more slides here. We did a little bit more towards zero and decarbonization with the standard, so I'll get to that. Um, in terms of combustion electrification, I did hint on this already, but for FIAS core, FIAS core is the only level that you that on-site combustion is okay, but electrification readiness is required. Um, so we are saying okay for combustion right now in the in the kind of lower level certification, but you must be. Um, must be ready to electrify. So we're trying to chart toward all electric buildings without absolutely forcing it upon design teams. For the core prescriptive and for zero, there's no fossil fuel combustion allowed. So we've, we've cut it out of two thirds of our programs and combustion is still allowed in FIAS core. Um, we now require electric vehicle readiness for all residential projects. And it's based on the number of parking spaces so um, basically there's a, number, a certain number of minimum, sorry, a certain minimum number of EV ready spaces and then a certain minimum number of EV capable spaces. So one, essentially the difference is it's provided with conduit and uh, EV ready is provided with a dedicated branch circuit. So you don't have to install chargers or anything. It's just making it EV ready so that it's ready for, um, for that shift to when we have more electrified vehicles. And then I did talk about this, but I want to reiterate here that we used a, a future source energy factor for grid electricity um, that looks at 2050. And again, this just puts puts natural gas on a more level playing field with grid electricity. And we um, it's based on the National Renewable Energy Labs mid case scenario. So they project out in the future, tons of different scenarios. Mid case is just things that are based on policies based of based on that previous year. So um, these are based on policies in place as of June 30th of last year. So pretty realistic things. If these policies go into place, this is what the grid generation mix will be in 2050. And then we calculated what with that grid generation mix, this is what the source energy factor for the grid electricity will be. Okay, and this is the last slide. I kind of want to just end on this note as I kind of talked about earlier with the, with the systems thinking for conservation. So. I wanna end on just emphasizing there is a ripple effect of conservation in a building. So again, as we're um, electrifying buildings, we're trying to turn over all of our fossil fuel based generation to renewable energy. We're designing for net zero, apparently Massachusetts is making zero code. Um, we need to consider how this zero is defined and how the designers are choosing to do the zero. Is that field of PV that Hank showed or is it conservation and, and using what you need um, or a much smaller footprint, less renewables? So the top scenario here kind of shows, okay, we have uh, four townhomes, they use 60,000 kilowatt hours per year. They need five PV panels, right, to get to zero. They need a certain amount of storage to either make that PV dispatchable when they want it or meet critical loads in the building. And then they need a certain amount of transmission or voltage capability to get the, um, the PV production away from the building when they're not using it. Um, so they need more transmission, more storage, more renewables, just to, to satisfy those four buildings. Or we can conserve 40% up front. And what that does is it ripples through the system. We need 40% less PV. We need less energy storage and we need less transmission. And a big part of the um, integrating more renewables into the, into the grid will be updating the infrastructure for transmission and for energy storage because renewable resources are intermittent as we know. So in order to make them actually usable, we'll need the energy storage and we'll need a lot of investment in transmission to get them from where they're being produced to where they're being used. So if we can consider saving more on the left end, that dollar ripples through the system way more than $1, way more than one fold. So I just wanna make that outside of the building economics of conservation that we use with our standards, there's, there's way more to it when you expand beyond the building. 
Okay, and that is my last slide. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Kat. That was that was tremendous. Um, great presentation, and, and Lisa, I really do like what you ended on there, um, really highlighting the importance of what we're talking about, starting with passive house and passive house strategies first to, to reduce that demand. It's critical, even if we all, even if whatever we do achieves the same goal of net zero, how we get there really matters. So we wanna open this up uh, a little bit to questions now. Um, there were a couple coming in the chat room, so I'm, I'm going to look at those and see if I uh, can ask any of those. But otherwise, folks, um, use the the hand raise feature, and I can unmute you, and you can answer you know you can ask your question live. Um, but there was one right here um, in the chat room. What about what about rehabs? You mentioned um, a new program addressing that, and maybe you can cover a, a little bit of about where where that stands. Yeah, sure. So it. We have a new name for it, uh, the revived program, but essentially it's the same as it was with 2018, where it is a, it's the same as our new certification program, but there are some exceptions uh, for existing conditions for retrofits that allow you to exceed those targets based on those existing conditions. So we're still advocating that you should push as far as um, as far as the new construction targets. It is something that we're pretty heavily investigating for the next um, for the next iteration of our standard. Um, understanding that the economics aren't always the same, right, for retrofits. But, you know, we've seen people meet it. Um, and we'd still like to advocate that that's, that's as far as we'd like people to go, even if, you know, <laughs> even if the yeah. economics aren't quite there. Go ahead, Kat. Yeah, maybe I can add on to that one too uh, for stuff that we're working on right now. And as we're kind of like wrapping our heads around the decarbonization strategies for existing buildings. Um, some of you might have heard me talk about before, uh, we were the founding partner of the Realize uh, program with uh, Rocky Mountain Institute. And we're now uh, a partner in the ABC collaborative, which is kind of like part two to the Realize program, uh, specifically uh, focusing on large scale uh, industrialized panel exterior retrofits. And our role in that program is to map out decarbonization strategies. So, um, work in progress, I'd say. So maybe in the next round of like uh, FIAS core revive or FIAS zero revive, we'll have like a kind of like a, an initial decision-making tree that then hopefully is much more based on economics. But just from like looking at the first kind of case studies, I feel like um, going as far as you possibly can uh, will almost always just from what I've seen beat out like incremental improvements over the next, I don't know, five, 10 years. Great, uh, Hank, you have your hand up. Oh, uh, still muted. muted. There we go, okay, yeah, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, um, I wanted to point out that we hope to kickstart the rehab programs also. We've actually submitted two mass save the idea that there should be a passive house retrofit program of incentives that would be worth $35,000 per unit. So if we get that, I think we will, we will see a lot of rehab work start to happen also. I don't know whether we'll get that far, but that's what we've advocated for. Um, but the other thing I would comment on is I'm struck by the fact that you show in, in your, your history slide, basically 9,500 units to date. That's great. It's a lot of units and a lot of square footage. And then I look at it and say, my God, we're gonna have 9,500 units in the pipeline by the end of this first three year program. And that's where I come back not to, to uh, say, aren't we doing well? I come back to saying, wow, we better get this right because we are really moving this fast. So those are, those are two comments I would make. Um, I have a question. Do you have a sense for how you're defining readiness for electrification? And I'll, I'll use an example. Like if you're saying somebody comes in and says, I just can't make it with hot water. I've got a hundred units and I'm putting, I can't do the, the heat pump hot water heaters. What, what it does readiness entail? Are you upping the service size to account for a future load? Are you um, 
putting in additional structure to account for additional tankage you might need? I mean, just curious, how, what is readiness involved? Yeah, so it's for hot, sorry, for hot water heating, um, it's, it is up to a certain size hot water heater, um, but it's essentially adding the, uh, making it close enough to a circuit and it is upping the service size, yeah. Um, I don't know about structure, if that's included. We aligned with the proposal um, in the NBI decarbonization code, which um, has an electrification readiness kind of proposal in code written language that people could adopt. What code was that again? It's called the NBI, the New Buildings Institute oh, yeah. decarbonization code. It just came out okay. of beginning of this year. Thank you. It's, yeah, it's similar to what was proposed for IECC 2021, if you're familiar with that. Okay. I'll mute myself here, sorry. There was a question here in the chat about uh, the proposed incentives for single family homes. Maybe if, if Hank, you wanna quickly cover that a bit. Uh, yeah, the, the, the um... We did not make a specific proposal. I think, I think we got up to recommending up to like $12,000 for a single family passive house. And we'll see, I know that the, I know that the Mass Safe consultants are seriously working on a, a passive house incentive program for one to four units. And we recommended on the order of 12,000 and We'll see where it goes. I think we're going to get a program. I, I don't know how much per unit we might get. Yeah. And um, this current proposal would be for the, the new uh, three-year plan, which funds the Mass Save program. So if it does kick in, it would kick in next year. Right. It would be begin, yep. uh, uh, beginning in 2022. Yeah. Um, Kind of talking a little bit on incentives, there's a question about um, subsidies for, for lower income residents with small single family homes. So basically again, helping people convert homes into, into passive house buildings. I don't know of anything here in, in Massachusetts, Cat or Lisa, if you know maybe of anything around the country or other ways that there's incentives that are helping folks uh, with, with retrofits. Cat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, <laughs> um, it, it, it's an interesting landscape that is developing, actually. So um, I would start with uh, for developers with Fannie Mae, uh, right? Um, they have been trying to get us to find them a pilot project. Uh, Fannie Mae is long term financing. So if you have a development, you, you have to get a construction loan. But then once you meet the fear standards, you actually get a lower uh, interest rate. So it's, it's actually really great. It's just like not very many people. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, we, we have a meeting with them. We should actually ask how many projects they've done so far. Um, so there's that. And then the other one um, that I find curious that is developing in Washington DC right now is the BEPS program. Uh, don't ask me what that stands for, Building Energy Performance <laughs> Score. Some, something like that. So Washington DC put in place, similar to New York, a uh, pretty uh, aggressive reduction schedule for existing buildings in terms of uh, emissions and EY. And they are kicking that loose now. They So building owners have to improve their buildings depending on a certain square footage size. And if they don't do it, so it's the reverse of incentive. If they don't do it, they have to pay a fine. So essentially the city decides to put an emissions um, kind of, uh, target, what do you call it, like cost on emissions or like an equivalent of carbon emission fine. Uh, that, that's that's how, how they kind of try to incentivize folks to actually make a pretty dramatic move. And we're involved in a, uh, in a project there developing the decarbonization um, st uh, strategy for fairly large multifamily buildings. So um, this is a very quickly developing market in Washington, D.C. And I wanted to mention that to you, Hank, as you're doing your advocacy work. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Mass is doing anything like that yet, but I think that is probably also something you want to look into and maybe kick loose um, sooner or later because it's coming. Uh, definitely New York and Washington, D.C. are taking steps. 
Yes, okay. we, 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 in, in conjunction with some other developers, we also submitted a suggestion for a program to expand what we call our lean program. Our lean program is, is a set of subsidies that are set up for affordable housing rehab retrofit work. And we've also submitted suggestions that would take those programs up into that $30,000 range. Mm -hmm. So they could choose to use the lean program, which would be um, a basket of conservation measures, but not necessarily passive house. And then we propose separate from that, a passive house retrofit program, which they could, which affordable could use or market rate could mm -hmm. use. Yeah. So we'll and I, see I've, I've never. Do you have experience with PACE? I I don't, but um, I I get solicitations all the time. Um, people basically saying there's like money there for any kind of upgrade you want to do to your building, but I have not been able to look into that in detail just yet. How we can use yeah, that no for pride. passive buildings. Um. Just to wrap up the question on incentives for low income residents here in Massachusetts, uh, I do know at least that, well, it's not the past house levels, the mass save program will provide 100% of the insulation of the cost mm -hmm. of insulation and air sealing for, for low income uh, residents in their homes. So, you know, if you are in one of the one of the many old leaky homes here in the state, you can at least, uh, you know, address that that problem and get some air sealing and some levels of insulation in the walls and the attic done. And they'll cover 100% of the cost if you meet the, the income qualifications. Um, so there was going back to the revive program. Uh, There's a question about will about the air tightness requirement. Will that specifically be lower? Uh, so right now it is the same. It's the same. OK. Yeah. That's all the question was. Um, yep, there is actually, there's a tighter requirement for the prescriptive program in terms mm -hmm. of like lower, not meaning, meaning more stringent. Mm -hmm. um, but. Well, it's worth, worth mentioning um, yeah. that the air tightness is based on durability of the wall, not necessarily energy reduction. Uh, so a retrofit or a new build, you don't want your wall to deteriorate. So it's a hard and fast uh, criterion. Right. Um, another question here came up here on, on retrofits. A lot of questions about them here. You can see there's a lot of interest. Uh, but what about just maybe as you were, you know, going through uh, revamping this revive program, this came up. But is there any studies or, or assessments, you know, of the of, of the value in a, in a home increasing when you do these type of deep energy retrofits? <laughs> Um, anyone else on on this uh, presentation today who might might know that answer as well can chime in and help us out. Uh, but it is a question that comes up even through when folks take advantage of these mass save assessments or uh, incentives as well to put insulation in their home. They always want to know what what value this is provide. So does anyone out there have yeah. have any good resources? There there is one um, that certified to FIAS in Chicago. It was a it, it had a high budget I think, but it it met the certification the retrofit program. Um, and they were able to sell it at the cost that they anticipated based on the added value of it. So I, I, I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, um, but it worked um, and it sold at the cost that was able to allow them to still profit as a, as a standard, you know, project. So that was we have successful. an example there. That's good. All right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's starting. Um, but it is something as we kind of talk about about passive house. And I know you guys are working on this as well through monitoring, but making sure, make help finding ways that we can get data like this, whether it's performance data or cost data and sharing that because as we expand this world of who, you know, who knows about passive house and who's building passive house and who's passing passive house policies, these are the questions they ask. Where's the data? So the more we can get that out, the, the better. Um, Hank, you have your, your hand up again. Yeah, I wanted to uh, come back to this question. We're, we're starting to struggle with this issue of renewables and it gets very complicated very quickly the minute you can't meet it on site. And we, uh, I'm interested in the thinking about the, the basically the 25% derating of the value of offsite renewables. If, if a project were to be able to demonstrate that they've taken advantage of everything they can do on their site, 
is there is there a reason to be penalizing the value of their offsite that they go after to meet the requirement? Yeah, I I wouldn't necessarily frame it as penalizing. It's more of just like an appropriate accounting of the energy that they're adding the um, or the renewable energy that they're facilitating onto the grid as part of their net zero equation. Um, so I, yeah, it's not it's not necessarily penalizing. It's just that the that energy isn't valued quite as high because of the other losses associated with it. It might not even be in their grid region. You know, it 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 might be part of a Texas wind farm that's actually being curtailed. You know, it's like there there's other things that are that are out of your control once you go off site. And then there's also transmission um, transmission losses. Okay. And is there for offsite, I've seen a whole lot of proposals from the zero code and others mm -hmm. about how the the way you have to demonstrate your ownership of these offsite renewables and the term of that ownership. Um, have you built that into yours? Or are you depending upon another program to define that those issues? We're mostly depending on ASHRAE 189.1, Appendix J, to define those issues um, in terms of like contracting. Uh, we do have the 20 year requirement um, for contracting. But yeah, most of that other stuff, we've just kind of leaned on organizations that have strictly focused on that. Yeah. All right, are there any other questions out there that folks have? Uh, this is the time to, uh, to get them out there. In the meantime, I have a plug. <laughs> <laughs> Kat mentioned it, but I thought I'd throw it up on the screen in case anyone missed it. We have a mechanical summit coming up next week. It's a combination of pre-recorded content. I think there's a couple hours of pre-recorded content per day. And then there's a two hour um, kind of headliner presentation with a panel of all the people that did the pre-recorded content for that day. So we kind of progress through the week. Uh, Kat has probably a lot better description of what this is, but kind of progress through the week of the uh, mechanicals from simplest to what are the solutions tools? What are the systems that are solving the solutions? What are the systems we desire? And then kind of how do we go all the way to zero energy and, and expanding beyond the building boundary more than just treating every kilowatt equal, microgrids, things like that. So um, kind of progressing all the way through that uh, in there, you can register for a single day or for the whole package. Yep, good one. And uh, there was another uh, question here from Betsy. Um, uh, regarding the Terrytown annual conference in uh, New York State. The dates are October 12th through 16th, and we are on as far as we know, unless some uh, pandemic uh, wrench is being thrown in, but we are very optimistic at this point that we will all be able to be together in Terrytown in October of this year. So looking forward to that. Right. I, have, I have one last question, maybe. The it, what did it what would it take or is it possible to do a net zero core prescriptive for this for the smaller building types? Right now, it's not possible. Um, we require that you do the energy modeling to get the zero certification. So the prescriptive is only, um, there's only a path to meet the core certification, which is just like the applying all the passive building best practices. So there's no renewables accounting or nothing related to renewables in the prescriptive path at all. Yeah. And do you have any idea what it would take? Is it just, is it a crazy idea to try to get that? Of no, no, not at all. Um, you can do it based on the HERS score. Um, so there's still HERS ratings required, the same quality assurance is required. And basically once you get to a HERS zero, that's when you'd get to zero. Um, we just don't use the HERS um, software for our certification. So we decided not to build a zero certification on that. And that's actually specifically one thing we asked for feedback on during the pilot release of 2021. And we didn't get a lot of um, kind of heavy response that people wanted to see that. But I think it could be something we could expand on in the future if it was, if it was needed or desired, I guess. Yeah, I think it could be 
uh, because the way the code work is going in this state, I wouldn't be shocked if in 2022 we have a, a net zero requirement on smaller houses where they have to demonstrate whether this, they wouldn't have to do it, but they have to demonstrate why they couldn't do it. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Yeah, it, it could definitely be done at the HERS energy model, or you could take a, pres a project that went the prescriptive path, model it in another software, and then figure out the renewables you needed to get to zero. Or you could do it with monitored data, uh, but they couldn't prove it with monitored data probably, because that would be after the fact, but. Right. All right, well, I'm out of questions and I thank you both so much for joining us. This has been a great kickoff for this because You've demonstrated all the points that we're pointing at. So <laughs> Thank you for having us. <laughs>